Welcome to the webinar, Achieving Your Optimal Health. And we focus on living every day in your optimal health for a longer, more active, satisfying life. Imagine what that'd be like. We're gonna help you get there. We have over 15 experts from a wide variety of Las Vegas health professions, and we're offering our best wisdom on how to attain your optimal health in a number of specific areas, ranging from nutrition, exercise, and pain management, to skin care, weight management, mindset, and much more. This series of weekly webinars began on June 12th, and it offers actionable insight that will move you toward attaining your optimal health. And what we mean by that is there's two parts to this. One is the information, and the information is from our top experts. The other part is that we're operating as a kind of support group where we're tracking our own goals and health goals. Uh, the, the webinar was originally set to end at the end of August. It may go beyond that, who knows. But, but the point is that that we're coming every Wednesday evening. You can not only learn uh, very important health information, knowledge, tips, but also you can identify a health goal, where you'd like to be by the end of the summer, by this fall, and, and just name that goal, and we support each other in your achieving it. So, um, what I'd like to do is is welcome our um, our team here. We have Loya Riggin, and and just give us one sentence about what you do. I'm a hypnotherapist, and I help people to live their best life. Excellent, and and Denise Tropia. Uh, yes, uh, by degree, I am a podiatrist, uh, lower leg uh, specialist, but I am in health and wellness, helping people regain and maintain their health. Okay, Gus Vargas. So I'm Gus Vargas, uh, owner and manager of Structure Body Therapies. We basically help people get pain free functional and and get in, in good physical performance so that in using only natural methods that way their body their physical body support. Oh. echo echo so that their physical body supports their goals that they have for the future excellent and sherry hi i'm sherry martin and um i'm a long time health insurance broker and I'm also a big proponent of natural health. I think our healthcare system needs to um, be revised to focus more on the root cause of disease rather than just treating the symptom. Okay, and Angela. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Angela Carlson and I am a board certified licensed naturopathic physician and I help people um, identify and treat the root cause of their of their health. Excellent, and, and I just noticed that um, Holly McClanahan and Anna M. Prima. Uh, sorry, Andy, I probably mispronounced it, but anyway, um, Holly, what? Tell us about yourself. What? Just give us one sentence. What do you do? Oh. Uh, I am a bioresonance practitioner and trauma resolution specialist, and what this means is I work with emotional issues and energy issues. Excellent. Annie? I work with the subconscious in different forms, intuitively through uh, quantum healing and with other techniques. Okay, and, and Anne McKeon just joined us. Um, and do you want to introduce yourself? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, I know Denise. I met Denise uh, not long ago. I um, coach people uh, through numerology, 
to help them uh, find uh, their purpose, find their path in life, understand who they really are. So that resumes it. Okay. So as you can see, we have some, some pretty high-powered health professionals here and who, whose goal is passionately to help people attain their optimal health. Um, I'm the only non-health professional here. Um, I'm a, um, a marketing specialist, and, and I guess my, my claim to, to health fame would be just trail running. I've got a trail running website, and, um, and I do a lot in the mountains. So uh, it takes a lot of help to make that work. Okay. So um, what I'd like to do is give you an opportunity now. Glad you're all here. I want to give you an opportunity to, um, to go ahead and then name a health goal. I'll mention mine first just to get, give you a little time to think about yours because one of the things we're doing here is, is helping one another as we identify a health goal and then, then track our progress. And mine would be low energy in the evenings. So I'd like to show more energy in the evening. You guys are energizing me right now. Normally at this point, I'm, I'm falling asleep. So, so that's my goal for the summer. And, um, and if I can get closer, that would be great. Okay, Sherry, do you wanna, do you have a health goal? Yeah, I've got several actually, but I would probably say I've got the energy issue too, but I've got inflammation I want to address this summer. Okay. Yeah. And Gus. So for the next three months, I have several health goals. One is to lose 20 pounds. Uh, I do a lot of activities and the extra weight doesn't help. And uh, sleep, incre increase the quality of my sleep. That's been a challenge for me. Uh, it's basically those are the two that I'm working on. Excellent, okay. And Denise? Uh, my health goals is uh, to be diligent with my yoga practice and uh, work on certain postures that I was having um, issues with and uh, improve on them, as well as also being more um, uh, with gratitude in the morning, every morning that I get up to express gratitude. And uh, I've been finding that it's been um, helping uh, quite a bit. As I hear these other health goals, I'm thinking, oh, I like these things too. <laughs> okay, so, um, Loya. Well, I lost 19 pounds since March 1st with just self-hypnosis. Um, I haven't really made any other changes in self-hypnosis, but I'd like to, with my back getting better now, I would like to actually be able to walk five miles to me that would be a huge win with my back issues and my spine issues and i'd like to lose 20 more pounds that's what i'm working on oh and to take up more hiking all right you'll like next week's webinar <laughs> good when it comes to hiking at least okay so um um holly or Okay, um, my health goal would be stamina, strength, and flexibility. Okay. And Annie, you're sitting right with her. Go ahead. Good to see um, you. I, I took some hits from deploying to the Middle East, so I have some damage to my nervous system or some over stress on my nervous system. So I'm working on working with Holly to resolve that and bring it back to an optimum level. And what, what is that again? Your My nervous system. Okay, resolve nervous system. What, what's, what's address, happening? Address what's causing it and remove that. Remove the, what would we call stress. that? The stress, stress on my nervous system. Okay, excellent. 
And then Anne, do you have a health goal that you'd like to focus on this summer? Hi, Anne. Good to see Hi. you. Um, I, uh, it's been a year now that I've, I started yoga. And I have a great teacher who knows how to realign my body. Uh, so I've, I'm doing that three to four times a week. So uh, that's my, uh, my health uh, thing right now. Okay, excellent. Now, what I'd like to ask, does anyone have a either a victory in their summer health goal that they'd like to share or maybe a barrier that that brings to mind a question that you'd like to ask our team gus well three weeks ago i started uh, doing intermittent fasting and that in itself isn't new to me but i i'm doing one meal a day i'm doing it for the health benefits in fasting uh, human growth hormones, uh, uh, autophagy, where my strong cells eat the uh, weaker cells, so it, my, my, my resilience increases. And uh, I, I, this wasn't important to me, but there's an advantage in it, just the losing of weight. I figured I have 110 pounds, 110 days worth of food on my body right now. So I'm quickly working down that. I, I don't think I need that much. And, and especially when I'm hiking or running, I don't want to log all that food around with me. So that's my motivation for one of my goals of, of, of losing 20 pounds. Okay. You're making some progress there. Yes. I lost Excellent. 10 already. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else want to share a victory or a question that you have? Well, uh, I um, uh, cured through that yoga. Uh, I had a, uh, I don't know what you call that in English. Uh, at the heel, facet, facet with the heel. Mm -hmm. uh, Plantar um, fasciitis? Yes, yes, that's okay. it. And I had that for three years. And after two courses in yoga, it's gone. Wow, that's so, huge. Two courses. Uh, because he makes us work with our, um, uh, looking for my words here, uh, just over the, uh, the heel is the, the muscle. The Achilles tendon? The Achilles, the, uh, the arch area? Well, no, higher up in the leg, in the back. Oh, okay, the, the calf muscle. The, yeah. The, the Achilles, calf. the gastrocnemius muscle. Yeah. Well, that was all very, very hard, because I've, I've worked all my life standing. So I guess there wasn't any more cushion under my heel. And because he makes us work with our legs a lot, so that, that brought the muscle back down to my heel after two two courses and i went to see specialists uh, they said you know some people said well if after three times uh, i can't do anything for you uh, go and see somebody else you know so just with two courses in yoga that's gone so for that's, me that is amazing that's awesome me, plantar fasciitis is really yeah. tough to yeah cure and, I, and i love walking. i love walking and uh, i don't need these things that you put in your shoe to uh, to you know, I had to put things in my shoe. And Orthotics. I was working, yeah, yeah, and uh, I was working standing a lot, and it was it was, and I loved walking, and I couldn't walk anymore. I couldn't do long walks. Uh, so this is fantastic. So that's isn't proof. it great to be active again? Yeah, it's great. But I was active, but it was just because I had this problem. I couldn't be yeah. active. Anymore. Yeah. 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 Okay. And um, yeah, welcome Tyler. Good to have you on board. What we're doing right now is, is sharing a health goal or asking a question, um, sharing a victory in our personal health. And um, who would like to go next? Who's experienced some positive uh, victory for their goal? Okay. Well, um, be thinking about that. Each week, we're not only 
uh, going to be getting some valuable information and health tips from the experts, but we're also operating as a support group here, naming a goal and then coming back and tracking our progress, supporting each other in that progress. Uh, you can ask a question of the experts and, and that's a, a real valuable opportunity. It's like a health mastermind group here. And um, you can also share a victory and we'll celebrate that with you. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is introduce our speaker of the day, Dr. Angela Carlson. And um, Dr. Carlson is a naturopathic physician. And what this means is, is her whole uh, goal is to help people uh, attain their optimal health through natural means and also heal issues that they may experience with natural means as opposed to pharmaceuticals. And um, now let's, so anyway, um, Dr. Carlson, do you want to, to go ahead and, and just say a little bit about your background and then just move right into the presentation? Okay, great. Thank you so much, David, and for everyone being here. Um, real briefly, as I said before, I'm a board-certified licensed naturopathic doctor. So I graduated from an nat accredited naturopathic medical program in 2012, and I did two years of residency after that, one year in general medicine and a second year in women's health, and then I have been in private practice since. I practiced in Southern Oregon um, at a naturopathic clinic for about three and a half years, and I moved to Las Vegas a little over a year ago and opened my own practice. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to go ahead and grab the screen? And I, I understand you have sure. a presentation. Yes. Let's, Let me, let's see here. So I'm going to go see. ahead and share my screen. Yes. And... Here we go, share. So are you guys, okay, let me, let me see if I can make this a little, a little better. Hang on, sorry. How, how is that? Do you see, do you see all of your Beautiful. pictures on the side? We see all the slides. Okay. Just great. And that's fine. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So this evening, um, here is a little outline of, of our agenda. So my topic this evening is um, how, to, how to determine your optimal diet. Our agenda tonight, I'm first going to start off by talking about the scope of the current health crisis and why we're in the current health crisis. Then I would like to discuss foods that are toxic to the body, some common nutritional myths, how to eat healthy on a budget, how to determine your healthy diet, and then we'll wrap up with the pillars of health like we've done in the other webinars. Are you guys excited? Ready to go? Okay. Definitely. <laughs> okay, so we are having a health crisis. I know I am speaking to the choir a little bit here, but always like to start out with some statistics. So diabetes and obesity affect more than 100 million Americans. More than 50% of Americans are overweight. 33% are clinically obese. Heart disease causes, one, causes four out of 10 deaths in the US. One third of Americans have high blood pressure which contributes to 800,000 strokes every year. More than, more than 36 million people are now living with dementia, and depression is now the leading cause of disability affecting more than 120 people worldwide. So these are really some staggering statistics that we've all touched on, and I just wanted to sort of remind us all of sort of the, the scope of the health crisis that we're in right now. And here is my take on why we're in the current health crisis. And you'll have to just forgive me for being fairly brief on some of these. Some of these um, are just 
introductory kind of topics like there's probably going to be a lot of questions and a lot of debate and that kind of thing and we can kind of take that up whenever we want to but here's kind of my take on why i think we're in one of the main reasons that we're in a current health crisis so if you think back our species has evolved roughly two million years ago you know where we were free where we were really free of the modern diseases that really devastate so many people and for two million years we lived as hunter gatherers where we ate the the meat that we hunted, we fit the fish that we caught, the vegetables, fruits, and sort of tubers, roots and tubers as along the way. However, 11,000 years ago, which is really only a small amount of time, if you think about 2 million years compared to 11,000 years, we, we had the agricultural revolution. And this was a time that dramatically altered human, our food supply. We began to have more sedentary lifestyle where we planted crops, and we started domesticating animals. And it was really during this time, only 11,000 years ago, that we saw the introduction of things like grains, milk, and meat from domesticated animals. So in terms of evolution, 11,000 years is such a brief period of time compared to the two million years that we were hunter-gatherers that we have what, what we term a genetic mismatch, that we're just really not genetically able to eat a lot of the foods that were that have become so prevalent since the agricultural revolution. Then we all know that in the 1800s we had the industrial revolution where we started to see mass production that really allowed for items like white flour, table sugar, vegetable oil, dairy products, and alcohol to really be common items at every household. Prior to that they had been sort they had been um, more challenging to come across and weren't as so common. The Industrial Revolution also brought a, diversity, a, a decrease in the diversity of the human diet around the world. Today, um, that's supposed to say 80%, sorry about that. Today, 80% of the world's population lives on just four crops. That would be wheat, rice, corn, and potatoes. And also during the Industrial Revolution, we saw that people moved to cities, they became more sedentary, and they worked longer hours, spending less time in the sun and less time sleeping. So what I'm trying to say here is that for two million years, we were hunter-gatherers where we primarily ate meat, we ate fish, and we gathered fruits and tubers along the way. Then 11,000 years ago, we developed, um, agriculture developed, and we started to have um, different foods that have now become normal staples to our diet, although our genetics haven't quite had the time to evolve the ability to be able to manage them, especially at such a large amount that we intake them currently. So the next, the next general topic that I wanted to talk about are some four main food groups that, that I feel are considered toxic to the body. And the first group is what we call cereal grains, and that is wheat, corn, rice, barley, thorgum, oats, rye, and millet. Then the next group is industrial seed oils. Those are like corn, cotton seeds, soybean, safflower, sunflower, canola, all the oils that come from seeds and they're made on an industrial scale. High fructose corn syrup and processed soy. So I'm gonna talk about each one of these in more detail as we go along. So the first one is cereal grains. So again, here's the list of all of the different cereal grains. And one thing to really understand is that these are, these are grasses. That's why they're called cereal grains. So imagine a field of wheat, right? It's a green grass. And what we're eating is we're eating the seed of that grass. And as I said before, while these are staples of the modern diet, we really haven't adapted genetically to be able to eat them in such large quantity. Again, uh, several of you have heard me talk about the fact that, again, these are seeds, and they're, they're seeds from a plant. And plants, they, they can't run away. You know, they can't run away from their from their um, threats. So they've had, to they've had to devise other ways to protect themselves. So they produce toxins, and those toxins are to, so that they can survive digestion, whether that's digestion through an animal or digestion through a human, the, the seed from the grain, it's, it wants to be able to survive digestion so that it can be eliminated and so that it can be a seed where it can create a plant. So the, these toxins that these plants make they really damage the lining of our digestive tract. They bind minerals and prevent, um, they bind and prevent the absorption of minerals, and they also block the absorption of proteins. 
So one of the most common examples of a plant toxin is something called gluten. And gluten is present in wheat and many of the other cereal grains. So again, if we just talk about evolution and just simple biology, if, if these grains are from a grass, they're a seed of a grass, they're not, they're, they're, their biological meaning is to withstand digestion and to get eliminated. So we've got, again, another mismatch and probably one of the reasons why we're having so many problems in our modern diet. So here, I'm not gonna really belabor on this too much, but here are some of the health concerns associated with gluten. You know, irritable bowel syndrome, memory, headaches, fatigue, joint and muscle pain, numbness and tingling, skin problems, mood issues, and generally inflammation. There's so many things in so many wide variety of ways that gluten and other plant toxins can, can um, affect us. Cereal grains also, uh, they're really lacking in nutrients, uh, especially active vitamin A, vitamin C, and B12. Okay, so the next one I wanted to talk about are industrial seed oils. So these again are the corn and cotton and soy, et cetera. And these were really not a part of our diet until recently. And they have been wrongfully promoted as heart healthy for a long time as alternatives to saturated fat. These industrial seed oils are very high in omega-6 fatty acids, and those in general are very inflammatory. In combination with an overall low intake of omega-3 fatty acids from things like seafood and fish that are anti-inflammatory. These are the types of oils that are basically found in any restaurant food. They're also found in you know, good quality uh, gluten-free crackers or chips or um, salad dressings. I mean, it's really hard unless you do all of your own cooking to, to avoid these kind of oils. But the primary thing that I'm advocating for is just the how they're used in restaurants and especially with fast food restaurants. So we've got a combination of, in general, our society is eating a lot of processed foods and we're not eating enough of the foods that are high in the omega-3s. So we've got a big disproportion of pro-inflammatory foods over anti-inflammatory foods. And inflammation, as we know, is associated with nearly all diseases, right? Now, whether that's heart disease or diabetes or obesity or IBS, or more concerning things like Crohn's or colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, cancer, et cetera. You know, so there's so many, um, there's, there's so much conversation right now about inflammation being the under, one of the main causes of um, chronic disease. So I really think it's important to kind of understand how these oils play a role in that. Okay, so processed sugar. This is a pretty, this is a pretty popular topic. Um, it's, it's amazing to think that the average American eats, you know, 152 pounds of sugar every year. That's just so crazy. And, you know, the health effects associated with, with sugar are vast, of course. You know, we have an increased risk of cancer, increased risk of IBS, other irritable bowel problems, and again, the obesity, diabetes, et cetera, with too much sugar. I want to take a moment and just talk about fructose for a second, especially from um, high fructose corn syrup. And this is found in processed foods, um, soda, and other beverages. Like, and it's also been mis it's also being labeled as corn sugar um, because the sugar industry is learning that that high fructose corn syrup is is sort of not cool anymore. So they're, mis they're, they're changing it up and they're now labeling things as corn sugar. Uh, so, so keep your eye out for that for sure. It's, it's really important to know that fructose is metabolized completely different than glucose. Um, it goes directly to the liver and is um, converted to fat. Um, so excessive, excessive fructose intake, um, will directly convert to, um, the excessive fruc fructose intake uh, increases abdominal fat, um, and that's the fat around our belly. Um, but you can see that kind of metabolic syndrome when people are skinny on the top, and then they have the, the belly, it kind of looks like they swallowed a basketball. Um, that's what we're talking about here, and that's a really strong risk factor for a lot of problems. Okay, let's see here.
Okay, so the next, the, the, the fourth one is um, processed soy. So processed soy is in nearly all packaged and processed food in many, many forms. Um, soy protein isolate, soy flour, soy lecithin, soybean oil, soy milk, etc. It's found in pretty much every food um, that's a convenient food, whether it's a bread or a pastry or a baked good, cookies, fruit juice, fast food, convenience food. So it's really hard uh, to, to avoid this one um, unless you're doing a good job um, looking for it. So like gluten, soy, really, soy also contains toxins that are damaging to the gut lining. And you know most people can tolerate eating processed soy or soy in low amounts, but because soy is added to so many different things in our diet, we're just getting so much of it that it is now becoming more of a problem. And we're, we're really knowing that the, the processed foods that tend to have more of the processed soy are, um, are really increase the risk for, for developing chronic disease. So we want to take that seriously. So some of the lesser known um, problems with soy is that when you eat soy, it will bind to the other minerals in your meal. And because it binds to the other minerals, it increases your requirement for vitamin D and vitamin B12. So you'll have a lot of people that are vegan and vegetarian, and I'm not trying to give anybody a hard time, but there's been a lot of misunderstandings around the nutrients in, in, in available to us through soy and grains and things. And actually, um, I believe that, that we actually end up needing more minerals and more things like vitamin D and B12 when we have an abundance of things like soy in our diet, not small amounts necessarily. Soy definitely um, in, disrupts our hormones. Um, it can impact fertility and increase breast cancer risk. And for some people, especially women, it can also have an impact on the thyroid. Okay, so here's where we're gonna get, do some fun things. I'm really excited about this part. Um, so uh, here are three common nutritional myths that I just wanna poke at, and we can, we can talk about this however you guys want to. Um, so we're gonna go through these three nutritional myths. The first one is that saturated fat is bad for you. So pretty much the sugar industry has played a joke on us for the last four or five decades. And they really wanted us to believe that saturated fat was the root of all evil. And it was what was contributing to heart disease when really it has been pretty much uncovered in the last five, six, 10 years or so that it's really sugar, not so much saturated fat that is the enemy. Now I, I do, I should have said this a while ago, but we are getting into the part of the presentation where, um, any time that I'm talking about animal protein, um, dairy or eggs, like I, I'm definitely advocating for the highest quality animal protein. You know, we're talking about eating um, organic or grass fed, grass finished. We're not just talking about eating um, any animal protein that doesn't have the, the quality kind of behind that. Um, so when I'm talking about saturated fat and I'm talking about animal protein, I'm not necessarily saying, I'm, I'm absolutely saying that it needs to be of the highest quality. Otherwise, what I'm saying does not um, really hold true. Um, so unfortunately, um, hydrogenated and partially hydrogenated oils replace saturated oils in the standard Western diet. And this has largely been due to misinformation. So again, those hydrogenated oils are really high in those inflammatory omega-6s, which is what is driving the modern disease epidemic that we have today. So as I said, over the last few years, scientists have uncovered the truth that saturated fats are good for us and they are critical to the body and that it's actually sugar and refined carbohydrates that are more to blame for modern disease. I'm a pretty strong advocate for crazy things like lard, coconut oil, ghee, olive oil, almond oil, organic beef, organic dairy. Uh, these are all saturated fats. They're all really good for us. And as long as they come from good quality sources, I believe them to be really, really healthy foods. Next one, cholesterol is bad and eggs are unhealthy. Again, for decades, it's been widely believed that eggs, because of their saturated fat and cholesterol, are, cause heart disease. This is just untrue. And studies back, dating back to the 1980s have been refuting this claim. It's just that people have, are so indoctrinated into believing that eggs, eggs increase cholesterol and cholesterol is bad that, that we just go along with it, even though 
the medical establishment no longer believes it. The truth is that we really need cholesterol to survive and eggs, as long as they are tolerated, not everybody can tolerate eggs. Eggs like gluten or like dairy are common food sensitivities. So sometimes people won't tolerate eggs, but otherwise they are a healthy food that I think are wonderful to have in our diet. Cholesterol, we need it for survival. Um, I believe we should worry less about our total cholesterol numbers and focus more on the HDL-LDL ratio and the triglycerides. And I, I advocate regularly for grass-fed beef, dark chocolate, and eggs. Now eggs, quality definitely matters. You know, the best are organic and free range or farm, like a, a, a where, where Gus gets the eggs um, at, at the farm, right? It's called the farm. Um, so local, far, local eggs whenever we can. And they're just, they have so many nutrients, vitamin B, vitamin E, vitamin D, minerals and antioxidants. Some of these are really hard to get elsewhere. Um, so eggs, eggs are definitely good for us. Oh, this is a great one. To control your weight, the only effective method is counting calories. Bottom line is the strategy really just does not work for most people. I believe that your daily calorie intake uh, does matter to some degree. If, you, if it's too low, your body will shut down physiologically. If it's too much, you'll likely gain weight. But what's actually much more important than counting calories is really focusing on the quality of the food, not just the quantity. The best way to lose weight and reduce disease risk is to reduce your carbohydrate intake, especially refined carbohydrates while increasing healthy fats. So I just put this on here to kind of remind everyone, where are we, what foods are we, are we reducing? Where are they coming from? So we're reducing refined carbohydrates and processed sugars from flour and grain products. This is really hard for, for most people. They say, well, what about rice? And what about um, rice flour, et cetera? And it's understandable. Um, but if you're trying to lose weight and reach your optimal, optimal health, and if you're struggling with any kind of health issue, it's, I recommend that you take out all flour products and reduce baked goods and pasta and processed foods and increase those healthy fats from all of those different sources that I talked about before. So one of the big things that come up when we start talking about eating organic and um, grass fed, et cetera, is cost. And I, I definitely understand that I have the same issue within my own life around how, you know, how do you know what to buy and how do you know what to prioritize? And so I, I put together a few tips on how to make decisions of what to prioritize if you need to do that with you and your family. One really great resource is um, the Environmental Working Group. So you can just Google Environmental Working Group and uh, every single year, it's a government organization, every single year they put out um, what's called the Dirty Dozen list and the Clean 15. And what these are, are lists that detail the pesticide content of non-organic produce. So if you need to know which, which one, which produce should I definitely buy organic because it has the highest pesticide content at the grocery store, those, those top five offenders, strawberries, spinach, nectarines, apples, and peaches, you wanna buy those organic because they are so high in pesticides and herbicides that um, they're just, they're not good for you any longer. And then the clean 15, um, so avocados, sweet corn, pineapples, cabbage, and onions, those were the top five. Those are the ones that would be fine to buy non-organic, you know? So you think about an avocado, you know, like it's $3 or something like that for an organic avocado and $1.79 for non-organic. So you can be like, okay, in this case, I can get a non-organic avocado, but I'm gonna make sure I get those organic strawberries. Um, and that will update every single year. With animal protein, it's a little more complex um, since organic is not really the same as grass-fed or free-range. And um, really, you just want to aim for the, the highest quality that you, can, that you can afford. And dairy is another thing to really always purchase organic. Um, conventional livestock is fed um, genetically modified soy and corn. And then in order to protect the cow, well, if the cows get sick because they're crowded, so they have to 
they pump them with hormones in order to make them have more milk and then they need to give them antibiotics because they're in crowded conditions and it's all that translates down to down to us in the milk so you really want to get organic dairy um, another tip is to to buy ingredients and um, not pre-made foods and really spend some time each week planning your meals that's a lot easier said than done but it's unavoidable. Um, I'm sure all of us understand that we have to spend some degree of meal preparation in order to succeed. Um, I mean, you can get home delivered meals and that kind of thing these days that are gluten free and healthier. But if we're talking about on a budget, um, it's really hard not to do some type of meal prep. Um, tip number three, uh, buy in bulk and share. So we all know these days mostly that you can buy things like coconut oil and olive oil and tomatoes, as much as you can buy, buy things in bulk rather than one at a time. You can always try to do like a cow share. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of places online where you can purchase a whole cow. So let's just say all of us on the webinar, we were like, okay, there's nine of us. Let's nine of us go in on a cow. We each get, we each get a portion and we put it in our freezer. We got great quality, great quality protein for near, you know, much less the cost than it is going to be at Whole Foods or you know Trader Joe's or something. And another great option is um, a, a CSA, which is a community supported agriculture farm. And we have a few of those. Um, there's, there's some good websites for that. There are a few outside of Las Vegas where you can basically arrange with the farmer to, have, to go to a drop off place in, in the city somewhere where every week they're bringing you a, a basket of fresh produce and that's that's awesome and then the last one is um, you know to choose cheaper cuts of meat so if we kind of throw out the concern about eating too much fat and we throw out the concern of saturated fat to a degree then we can sort of look at some of these other things like brisket and short ribs and oxtail and shanks and even higher fat ground meat and that are less expensive and again, as long as they're high quality, then we can really save a lot of money here because we're buying them grass-fed and organic. And uh, they, they're inexpensive. You can put them in the crock pot. They last a long time. So I really think that's an awesome consideration. Okay, so now um, in the last few minutes here, I'm going to talk about, so this is sort of like what my clinical approach is, what I do with my clients. Um, what I do with my friends and family or whoever um, is really looking to find out what their what their optimal diet is. There's not really a one size fits all with when it comes to diet. And so in my practice, I have a three step approach. The first step is basically where uh, we discuss um, what's called the paleo metabolic reset diet. And uh, it's very similar to the whole 30, which is a paleo diet that's very available online. And we, you know, what one place to start is, is we're eliminating those four foods that we talked about in the beginning. You know, we're, we're eliminating the cereal grains, the industrial seed oils, the processed sugar, and the processed soy, and we're eating clean. We're really paying attention to where are we getting the toxins um, from our food. And then after we do that for a period of time, it's a minimum of 30 days. It really depends on the person and what they have going on. Then we start to reintroduce foods back in during the restore phase. And everybody... All foods affect people differently. So the step two is very individualized. And then, then we move on to step three. Maybe this is, it's really hard to say. It could be three months down the line. It could be six months down the line. It just depends. Um, and at that point in time, we're really focusing on re the revitalization process where we're trying to figure out what combination of carbs, fats, and proteins is ideal for you. What about intermittent fasting, like Gus was saying earlier? Um, how do we build in some flexibility and make this like a long-term, more sustainable plan? So let's say that you all wanted to get started today. What would you do, right? You know, so, so let's get started today for 30 days. If each one of us wanted to figure out, you know, what is my optimal diet? You know, if David is struggling with a little bit of fatigue. You know, he could consider, you know, doing this. Uh, any of us could, I'm just picking on David, um, you know, he decided to remove all of these things for 30 days. You know, we're talking about removing grains, all grains, including gluten, taking out industrial seed oils, taking out sugar, taking out processed soy, and really emphasizing the good quality animal protein and chicken, um, fish, and eggs, and lots of vegetables, adding in ferment fermented veggies, and healthy fats, and doing that for 30 days 
and then you're then you're cautiously adding one thing back in at a time you will notice what kinds of things are affecting your energy um, or for me um, it's it's all for me it's also energy it's weight it's for me it um, it's a uh, mental clarity and brain fog is a big thing for me or quality of sleep um, so all of us kind of have different ways that these types of things um, affect us and so this is what I propose to be um, an approach where you're eating really healthy and really clean for a period of time, reintroducing things. And you're, I mean, we have certain generalized rules um, like processed sugars and processed soy and thing, but there are other gray area foods that everyone tolerates a little bit differently. So if you really want to learn your optimal diet, you kind of have to go through a little bit of a process like this in order to know what, how it really affects you. Okay, I'm almost done here. So I just wanted to put this in because I've been doing this um, plan in my practice a lot and I'm getting some really good testimonials. And here's some, here's some examples of things I've heard just in the past couple of days. I can't believe I don't have back pain anymore. I no longer have heartburn or reflux. I have finally started to lose weight. My energy is so much better. I feel so much better. I don't even want to have gluten again. And this is, these are Literally, ladies I have talked to in the last two days, these are what they're saying. So it's been really encouraging. Okay, so then this last bit here um, is kind of wrapping it around to the five pillars of optimal health. Um, so when we're talking about optimal health and nutrition from a physical standpoint, you know, we have better energy, we have less pain, um, deeper and better quality sleep, increased movement and exercise. Um, Mentally, a more positive outlook, then we can feel a little bit better about ourselves and our body. We have more peace of mind and kind of less distress about our health when we're feeling better. From an emotional standpoint, I really think that eating healthy is empowering. You know, you really take control and feel just more calm and that you're able to manage everyday stressors better. You become more available for personal growth and developing deeper and stronger connections with others, improve relationships with your loved ones. I think that from a social standpoint, when we feel better, we have more energy, we have less pain. So again, we have a better sense of self. We're more able to participate in social activities in our community and engaging with children. And from a spiritual level, if we're living less day to day, and you know, if we're not in constant overwhelm and constant stress, where we're just kind of putting one foot in front of the other on a day-to-day -day basis, we, we allow there to be some opening, some mental space available to pursue a spiritual practice. Like whatever that might be, that could be different. That could be trail running. That could be a meditation practice. That could be yoga. You know, it's like if we are just go, 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 stress, stress, stress all the time, then we don't tend to have um, availability for that. And so I really think that eating a healthy diet, learning what kind of foods impact you, and just learning about general dietary principles in general is a really good place um, to start when we're talking about optimal health, optimal wellness, and nutrition. So I believe that is the end of my, of my presentation. Thank you. Very, very awesome, Dr. Angela. Appreciate that so much. And here's her contact information. Uh, you you do consultation with individuals, then, do you not? Of course, yes. I um I have a practice. Um, I practice in a in a clinic with integrative called Integrative Acupuncture. We have uh, two acupuncture physicians, myself and a massage therapist, and um, their address is there and my website, etc. So if anybody wants to reach out with any kind of questions or interest, you can feel free to contact me in any of those ways. Excellent. Well, does anyone have any questions for Dr. Angela? Um. So at a mommy's to be avoided then, right? Um, so it depends. It's a, it's a good question. It depends on um, what, what, what you're doing exactly. If you're in the phase of, um, of having no, no soy for like what I advocate for the first 30 days, um, then, then no edamame. Um, after that, uh, if you want to add in soy, I think edamame is the best one to add in. Um, I still, I don't think that edamame is like an A, 
and A plus food. I think animal protein and eggs and, and eggs and fish are better sources of protein, but I think that edamame is a reasonable thing to have from time to time. Um, and then, so on the, um, the safe foods, it says sweet corn. The sweet, is that, is corn a grain? I can't remember. Was corn, that corn, corn is a grain. I think corn, I'm not actually not a hundred. I'm pretty sure corn is a grain. It's a good question. Is it a fruit or is it a grain? I'm pretty sure corn is a grain. Um, so, uh, yeah, tech, I mean, so technically during the first 30 days, I have people come off corn for a period of time. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess that's it for me. Well, what do you think about keto? What do I think about keto? Um, uh -huh. I think that, uh, I think that keto, um, it, it can be fine for, can be fine for some. I mean, it's, it's a pretty, it's pretty similar along the, what I'm advocating for a higher fat, lower carbohydrate diet. Um, and I think for some, if, if that resonates with you, I think that's fine. I don't think that it should be done forever. I don't think it should be done long-term. I don't think it's a long-term diet. Um, where I feel like the structure of what I just outlined to you is, is sustainable, I think, longer term. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. What about a modified corn starch? You see that in a lot of foods. I don't think that modified corn starch is a good thing at all. Um, I, I mean, I don't think that it's, it's, I, it probably affects different people in different ways, just like carrageenan, right? You know, carrageenan is, um, an additive in the like almond milk and coconut milk and that kind of thing. It's from, a, it's from seaweed and some people are fine and other people that have like irritable bowel or something like that, carrageenan might be an issue. So if someone has a real bad corn sensitivity, then modified cornstarch probably isn't the greatest thing. But um, I think it's probably not the greatest thing, but I don't, it's not something that I super panic about. What do you think about it, Dr. Tropia? Yeah, I think there can definitely be problems yeah. you know, with the gut with it. And uh, they, they're just like kind of putting it in there, you know, hiding it in there. And people really have to figure out, now, what exactly is it? It's not high fructose corn syrup and it's not corn sugar, but what exactly is modified corn starch? So it could be very difficult, yes, on the intestines. Absolutely. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh -huh. off of... Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, uh, Holly. No, 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 that's okay. That's okay. Go. I, I, so I just wanted to, uh, on top of what Denise was saying, uh, I have, you know, we want to uh, avoid processed sugar, but something that confuses me and my wife Dawn is we see high fru fructose corn syrup, right? We stay away from that, but we see corn syrup, and we don't know what the difference is. Um, well, I think that one of them is more concentrated than another. Um, because corn has fructose in it. And so it's basically, um, corn syrup is, uh, I think it's less concentrated, you know, like, so they're both, they're both, um, manufactured. They're not, they don't exist naturally in the world. They have to be made. Right. So, um, so I think high fructose is just going to be a lot more concentrated, uh, than the, than the corn syrup. And it might also quite honestly, just be a, a play on words you know, of how, of how they're putting things in, in, in labels and that kind of thing, you know, um, but it's probably just more constant. It's probably not as concentrated as high fructose corn syrup in Thank my, you. in my guess. I'm not entirely certain, but that's my best guess. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, I've been practicing uh, using every day, uh, after my yoga, uh, I, I mix, uh, I, I make, um, uh, a drink with hemp, uh, cocoa, bio, uh, bio cocoa, uh, uh, almond milk, and a, and a banana. Is that a good combination? Is that, uh, does that do the job? I, is there anything that I should not use in there? Or? Sure. Good question. So um, you're, I'm assuming you're talking about hemp seeds, right? Like they come in a package and you put them in. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, so what, so I think, um, I think that's a good combination. Um, what, what comes to mind is that it's, it's fairly low in protein. You know, you're probably only getting about 10 milligrams of protein. Cause if you, re if you look on the back of that hemp um, container, the two, uh, two uh, big uh, spoons, 
Okay. So I think you're, you know, go ahead and look on the back of that and tell me how many grams of protein are in how much. I think it's like five grams in a tablespoon or five of protein. Eh? Um, okay. 10 grams. Okay. In one tablespoon? Uh, hmm. In uh, three, uh, three tablespoons. Yeah. So you say, yeah. So, so three tablespoons, you're getting 10, you're getting 10 grams of protein. So, you know, um, I, I think that that's okay, but it's probably, it depends on what you're using it for. If it's just like an after, after, um, it's a meal. If you're going to have another meal. I think it's fine. It's like a meal. So should I add some more, uh, hands? I mean, I, I would, I would consider finding, you know, considering adding more protein somehow to that. Now it's a little challenging to do that. You know, we get into a difficulty here where it's like, well, what are your options? Your op options are whey. They're like pea, you know, a pea powder protein. There's collagen protein, you know? Um, so, I mean, you could, I don't know if you tolerate dairy, but you could get like some really good quality Greek yogurt. That might be an option because that's pretty high in protein. Um, so you could use it, you could add <coughs> almond milk or coconut milk that you use. Uh, that's what I use, almond milk. Oh, okay, that's good. So you got a little extra protein there. So yeah, you know, that, that's the main thing is that it's just a little bit low on protein. I love all the ingredients that you said. Um, it's really you know, tasty and it's, it's yeah. like a meal, eh? It's, uh, it really fills me up. It's a meal. I and I that. think that works. You know, not everybody needs the same amount of protein. You know, um, so if you're eating it and you feel satiated for a couple of hours and you feel good, then I think that that's reasonable. I use cocoa, the biological co cocoa, which is, uh, you said ch uh, dark chocolate was good also. I don't know if... Uh, yeah, I was happy to see that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Me too. I love, I love chocolate. Yeah, yeah I, I, you know, dark chocolate and uh, cacao are um, very high in nutrients, um, for sure. Yeah, okay. so I think that's great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I want to be true to our time here. We're, we got three minutes to go. And um, thank you, Dr. Angela. I loved your 30-day challenge. And thank you, guys. I'm going to look at that again, <laughs> and we'll do it. Now, there was a lot of information in Dr. Angela's presentation. So what I would like to, um, let's see, can you stop sharing your screen? I want to show everyone where you can get the replays of these videos. Excellent. Okay. So uh, here we go. Okay. I'm putting the videos on my trail running site which is lasvegasareatrails.com. And if you go over to the far link, which is health education, then you can see, well, there's Gus from last week. And um, it's basically a series of blog articles. And you click on the title <coughs> of the article. And it goes right to the the video. You can click on the video and you get Gus's presentation or Denise's presentation the week before, our introductory presentation the week before that. And then I've got some notes uh, below so you can skim the notes. So that's how you get the, um, you can get the replays and then um, you need to register each week for this webinar, and it's the same link. So just go to this same, you know, lasvegasareatrails.com, go to health education, and you're going to see this registration button right here. And, and just go ahead and click that, register for the next webinar, and, and we hope to see you throughout the, the summer. Uh, there's there's a lot more um, uh, very informative webinars coming. Next week is going to be, as a matter of fact, is is me and and what I'm going to be sharing. Like I said, I'm not a health professional, but I am a person who has focused on on health and one passionate health pursuit, 
throughout my my life that I want to share with you and then help you to dial into your passion that's going to cause you to easily do you know carry through with your 30 day challenges or with with whatever health goal that you have because as you know there are so many um you go to anyone's garage and you can see the old um uh, exercise machine that you know they had high hopes and and then something just didn't work or the the athletic club that that a person became a member of the athletic club and was gun ho for a couple of weeks and they just fizzled out and i've um i've i've really asked myself the question what makes people continue with whatever exercise or health discipline that they set what motivates you because no matter what um great information you have if you don't follow through it's going to do no good so um we're going to talk about easily achieving your goal through just tweaking your motivation a little bit next week and and i'll share a little more of that um, so it's going to all be on motivating yourself to attain your health goals okay well this concludes our our webinar for today and again thank you dr angela and there i know the people here had more questions for you so um encourage you to call dr angela she's friendly she's approachable she's knowledgeable and and perhaps schedule a, a consultation with her because just an hour or so sitting down with dr angela could make a huge difference you get started right and the whole program works better